It's so good to be with you today. If we'll make your way over to John chapter 7. We have a little different approach on this today. I want you to look down to verse 37. When I first started preaching, I always uh, was looking for just what I wanted to do, right? How do you how do you have developed your style? So I started preaching backwards. <laughs> And uh, I don't know there's much style or much originality in it, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of dyslexic anyway, so that's kind of how that works. John chapter 7, verse 37, if you find it, say amen. amen. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, uh, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of water. But he, this he spoke concerning the Spirit, of whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Let's pray. Dear Father, we do come to you today, Lord, and we're just thanking you for all that you're about to do with us in this word, Lord. I do ask for your wisdom and your understanding, Lord, your patience, Lord, as we uh, approach this scripture, Lord, and as we begin to enter into the last six months of of Christ's life here in the book of John, Lord, and, and all the details that we'll have in these next few chapters, Lord, on the verse, chapter 21. I pray that we are able to consume it, Lord, but not get bogged down, Lord. Able to understand it, Lord, and not misplace it, Lord. Able to hold on to it, Lord, and not lose it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So when we begin to look at this verse of Scripture and this time in Jesus' life, Going back up to verse 1 of chapter 7, it says after these things, well, we looked at uh, verse 6 and we saw that he had fed the multitudes and they wanted to make him a king. Now some time has passed and now it's moving on to the Feast of the Tabernacles. Jewish men were required to, uh, to attend at least three of the feasts that the Jews had by going to Jerusalem. That was the, the Passover. Jewish males were... Uh, uh, to attend that, they were attend the, uh, the 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 tabernacle or the feast of booths, and they were to attend Pentecost or the feast of harvest. So Jesus uh, was there in Galilee, and he walked according to our Bible in around Galilee, moving out of Judea because the Jews or those in authority, the Jewish rulers there, the scribes and the Pharisees and and the Sadducees, the high priest, all them sought to kill him. So he stayed out of their way. And chapter 7 puts in a very uh, a big break of time after these things. Again, it moves forward to the last six months of Jesus' uh, uh, ministry here on earth. So we have a lot of detail uh, to cover here in these next few chapters concerning a very short time in Jesus' life. Remember, Jesus is, uh, John was not concerned about a chronological order. He was interested in showing the signs and teaching the message that we might believe that Jesus was the Son of God or that He was God and then believing in Him that we might have eternal life. So Jesus comes and, and the Feast of Tabernacle was at hand and people expected Him to go. Now His brothers and sisters, uh, half-brothers, half-sisters, we find uh, those listed over in Matthew chapter 24, verse uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. We know that he has at least four half brothers and and sisters. So we know he has at least two sisters. Uh, these had not yet believed on him, and they call him out and say, you know, uh, if, uh, it's time for you to get out of secret. If you're really the Christ, if you're really the Messiah. It's time for you to go openly show this and get this show on the road. But Jesus was not about man's advice or about man's time. And he was not interested in whether his family thought he was a fraud or the Pharisees thought he was a fraud or us today think that he's a fraud. Uh, he's concerned about doing the business of his father. So he has his brothers, uh, half-brothers anyway, going up to the, the uh, feast there and then uh, him and his disciples follow a little bit later on. And there in the middle of the feast, remember Jesus didn't say he wasn't coming. He just said, I'm not going to go at this time because my time is not at hand. Jesus very, uh, very uh, drilled into the fact that uh, he had a very specific time and he was on a very specific 
a pattern for his life that his father had already saw. So uh, his brothers had gone over verse 10, and, uh, and there was much complaining, verse 12, among the people saying, He is good, and other city on the country, he deceived the people. However, no one spoke openly for fears of the Jews. Right. They were still trying to make up their mind about Christ. Uh, they were still trying to do that. And notice the word uh, complaining. We see that word complaining a little later on. We'll see the word murmuring. And we know that all the way back into the time that the children of Israel were getting ready to leave out of Egypt and going uh, to the wilderness and into the promised land by the way, the, the Feast of the Tabernacles, uh, the Feast of Booths, uh, commemorate that time they had spent in the wilderness, in that desert land. It, 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 was, it was a very neat feast. Uh, uh, there would be light shows and big candles of the show of the pillar of fire by day that led them. Uh, the, there would be uh, wa water that came in for seven days. They would bring in water from the, uh, the river down there. They would bring it in through the water gate and they would pour it out. And then on the last day they would pour out a double pouring of water to show the abundance how God provided the water for them. Uh, even by Moses talking to a rock and then Moses striking a rock and all of that, how, how that uh, God provided for them. And it was a great time. They, had, they didn't have tents or, or they didn't have campers, but they had little booths and they just made a big uh, time of it outdoors at that time of the year. Uh, so they were going up there to be part of this. And, and as these national holidays happened, you know, they had a lot of patriotic stuff going on. It's even us, right? When it gets time for Memorial Day, we... We start seeing a few more flags put out when it gets time for the 4th of July. We all kind of uh, still have some kind of national fervor. So there was still a national fervor. And Jesus still had, even though in verse 6, in chapter 6, many people had left him because of his hard saying about they having to eat his flesh and drink his blood or, or they had to take in and get committed to him. Uh, this hard saying had made me to leave, but Jesus was still able to draw a crowd when he came. But Jesus didn't come for the crowd's sake. He came for our sake, individual's sake. So uh, these people kept their murmuring and their complaining and their, their arguing and their uh, thoughts to themselves in a quiet, kind of hush, rumbling tone uh, so that they wouldn't get in trouble uh, by these uh, all-powerful Pharisees and scribes and such. And uh, verse 14 says that then suddenly, right, or now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and talked. That's what he did. He went up and talked. They were looking for him, but Jesus wasn't hiding. Jesus goes right up in the middle of the temple during the middle of the feast and begins to teach. And Jesus uh, uh, teaches in such a way that the Jews marvel, saying, how does this man know the letters, having never studied, right? He, he never had any formal training. How does he... Know the Word of God so well. Well, it's really easy to know something when you've done it and, uh, yourself, right? If I make a cake, I know what I've done to it, right? If I am able to put together a birdhouse, I know what I've done to it. I have intimate knowledge of it. Jesus, of course, is the Word of God made flesh, so He had intimate knowledge of the Word of God. And, and think about this. He's going to lay out some stuff here in a few moments, and, and His idea here is that you first have to submit before you can understand. It's all through the Bible, right? And if you don't first submit to God and what God's got going on and what God's planning, you're not going to be able to understand His Word. You know the old saying, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Well, the way to our mind as far as Jesus is concerned is a heart. When we first begin to become obedient, then we get to be able to open up God's Word. Verse 16 says, My doctrine is not mine, but He sent me. I'm not teaching this for myself. Uh, there's a reason I'm teaching in such a way is because I'm not concerned about building up my own reputation. I'm not concerned about my own popularity. I'm not concerned about your prosperity. What I'm concerned about is telling you exactly what the Father has said. And if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. So if you first submit to God, then you'll begin to understand that Jesus is speaking from the authority of heaven. So again, the idea here is that you must first submit before you understand. And because people don't submit, there's a lot of misunderstanding. 
Think about all the knowledge that was laid up in the scribes and the Pharisees. Think about all that they had done. And they were willing to spend a large parts of their life memorizing uh, not only the Holy Scriptures, but all the, the commentary that went on in the Talmud and the Manishka and all of those things that went with those traditions. They, they, they picked that apart and they took that in. And yet they were the most misunderstanding people of God's Word you'll ever meet. These people had never submitted to God. That's really and truly what the real problem is, is submission. They never submit to God, and because of that, they continue to have not humility, but pride. And pride always goes before the fall, and pride always separates us from what God's got planned in His life for us. And verse 18 says, he says, He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, right? I'm not doing that. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? Here Moses, the one that you have loved, and the one that you say is, is the it, right? If we were, again, to combine the idea of George Washington and Billy Graham together, we would come close to what they had as far as Moses. He was not only the founder of of the nation as far as they were concerned, but he was also he was also the, the, the religious leader at that time for them. So they held him in high regards and his law that he brought down was was what it was. But we know ever since he brought the the, the tablets off the mountains that they were in rebellion and never kept God's word. And the people answered and said, You have a demon, who's seeking to kill you, right? We already know who's seeking to kill you. Verse two says, uh, verse one says, because the Jews are the authoritarian rulers, were seeking to kill them. These people again coming up as pilgrims had no idea the inner workings of what was actually happening in Jerusalem. They had no idea what was really going on, and yet there were people trying to kill Jesus even at that time. So Jesus says, this is what the problem is. Verse twenty one, I did one work and you marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision that is not. Uh, from Moses, but for the fathers, and your circumcision inside the man on the seventh. If a man receives circumcision on the seventh, so the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the seventh? So, you remember that guy who's sitting there at the well and wants to be made well in verse 5? And Jesus makes him well, takes up his mat, and they're all mad because he's worked the work of God on the seventh. Jesus says, you break the law of Moses just to circumcise somebody, right? Now, I've been nursing a long time, been in elective surgery a long time, and, and I've seen a lot of people both before circumcision and after circumcision uh, from just a few months old all the way up into their 80s and 90s, and I've never known one after the numbing medicine wore off who thought that circumcision could not be delayed one day. <laughs> so, uh, here... This small little tag of flesh, you hold all this to, and you'll break the law of Moses just on the eighth day to make sure, even if it's on the seventh, you get it in. But you won't let me heal a man who'd been infirm for some 38 years. It makes you mad. See, when you start out with self-righteousness as opposed to righteousness, then self is the standard. You're able to look at the things that you do and still be able to judge other folks for the things they do because your stuff is, is not as, as bad as their stuff. They're in worse shape than you are. You know, that's one of the reasons we don't have a lot of church discipline anymore. When we find somebody in trouble, we don't go to them and try to make it right or we don't go to them and bring them before the church because uh, we, we don't want anybody called out about sin. We don't want anybody uh, pointing the finger at us. We don't want to point the finger at anybody in case they point it back at us because we know how frail and how fragile we are. But when Jesus talks about how it goes, he talks about not going on the authority of ourselves, but on the authority of God's Word and not putting it out because we're trying to be prideful and better than somebody else, but we approach people even if we have to correct them in love. Because the only real cure for sin has always been the blood of Christ. That was God's cure for sin. 
The Pharisees and the scribes, they would come out and they would point out sin so much so that they caught a woman in the very act of adultery. They bring her there and they want Jesus to be the first one to throw a stone. He does not throw a stone. You remember the story? He says, you who without sin, let him throw the first stone from the oldest to the youngest that begin to leave so that only he remains. And yes, he could have righteously thrown the first stone, but instead he chose to have mercy. And sends that lady away, telling her to not do this anymore. Do away with the adultery and the sin in her life. And the reason for that was not because it started with self, but it started with mercy. And it started with grace. And it was cured by Christ's blood. He says in verse 24, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge according to a righteous judgment. Right? You want the outside to look right, but the inside is what really matters. And again, the problem for them was submission. They would always keep misunderstanding because they always started out with pride as opposed to submission. Verse 25 says, Now some of the Jew, uh, them from Jerusalem said, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? Right? Well, we got these people who are trying to kill you in verse 20. And then five verses later, somebody up there knows something's going on. But look, he speaks boldly. And they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know that indeed this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he comes from. They, again, we approached this last time we were together. They thought they knew where he was from. They truly believed he came from Galilee. They really believed he was in and around Capernaum, but was from Nazareth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right? That's where he was. Physically a person, but where did he really come from? He came to Galilee by way of Egypt from Bethlehem, right? So Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, and that's where he was born, but nobody sought to look into that. And Jesus cried out and said, as he taught in the temple, saying, right? Here he is, he's standing in his teaching. Normally the rabbi would sit down when he talked, but this was so important, we see Jesus standing and crying out, you both know me and you know where, I, where I'm from, and, uh, and you have not come, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Again, making sure everybody knew that he was from heaven. We talked about that just a minute ago, that, you know, did Christ ever equate himself with the Father? Yes, over and over again, Jesus never left any doubt that he had come from a different place and he was here for a different person, a purpose. And uh, therefore they sought to, to take him, but no one laid hand on him because the hour has not yet come. How powerful is Christ, right? You see him as meek and mild, but he's there preaching and they sent their guards out after him to surround him and get him. But because it was not his time, they were terrified to lay their hands on him. And many people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these, which this man has done? Again, the, the volume of the people he healed, the volume of the people who he raised from the dead, the volume of the people whose demons were cast out and all the sickness was completely healed, were racking up and people were looking and saying, this is what it looks like when Messiah comes. We might as well say, this is Messiah. Verse 32 says, and the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring, right? That whole idea of murmuring. And that word murmuring has the, has the idea of sounding like what was happening. That murmuring out there, you know, that talking among yourself and, and low rhythmic volumes. And, and uh, these things concerning him, the Pharisees and the chief priests and officers to take him. And Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer than I. I will go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me where I am. You cannot come. Well, there's a reason for that. Remember, we have moved down to the last six months of your life. A little while longer, he's going to be crucified. A little while longer, he's going to be in a tomb. A few days after that, he's going to be risen. Forty days after that, he's going to ascend back in heaven. And these guys can't follow him because he's going back from where he came from. And Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go? Shall we not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? That's funny because after Jesus sets his apostles 
after 40 days out, he does send them out into uh, Jerusalem and Samaria and all the part of the world. He sends his message out to non-Greeks and to non-believers. He really will do that. Um, we're part of that. And Jesus says, what is this thing he said? What is this thing he says? You seek me and you will not find me. For where I am, you cannot come. Again, the problem is Jesus Christ is either natural or he's supernatural. Either he's just a guy walking around, running his mouth, wearing a robe and flip-flops, with a long beard and a hair uh, and, a, and, and, and a net over his head, or, or, or he's the Christ. That's always the difference, right? Either Christ is natural or he's supernatural. If he's natural, you owe him nothing. But if he's supernatural, you owe him everything. That's really the real problem. Why won't people come to Christ? Well, they think he's natural. We get talking Sunday school this morning. He's been so gone so long, right? that he's not coming back anytime soon. Well, Jesus said, you know, you're not going to know the hour, nor the day I come, I'm going to come at an unexpected time, like a thief in the night. You're not going to know you need to be ready. See, naturally, we don't think that somebody can hang around for 2,000 plus years and be in any shape to come back. Anybody? There's plenty of folks in these grounds who've been dead and gone for... For 2,000 plus years, we just don't see anything happening with them coming. That's because that's natural. The problem is, with that line of thinking, is that Jesus is not natural. Again, going back to uh, our Sunday school lesson, uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 8 tells us that one day with the Lord is a, a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. There's, there's no... There's no Time that affects Christ while our moment in time seems to drag on and drag on and drag on until uh, they take us up in a box and put us out back. Christ's time is always fresh and, and new and it's, it's like spring. He's always awake and it's eternal. And time and its passing does not affect him. He's apart from it. So uh, who cares when he comes back? You just need to be ready. So, verse 37. We're going to sit down here for a minute or two when we finish. Feast of Booth, Feast of Tabernacles. One of the components was the high priest would go down to the little river and he would bring up a, a bath of water and he would go to the temple and he would pour it out. And each day it would signify an outpouring of God's provision for his people in the wilderness. On the last day, the great day of the feast, they would come and bring a double portion of that water and they would pour it out and speak about the abundance of God. How God is more than able to make provision. And on that day of the feast, when God has been signified or symbolized as abundantly pouring out His blessing on His people, on that day Christ stands and He cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow living water. And he's speaking here concerning the Holy Spirit. God's provision for those people in that dry wilderness land, in that desert land, depending as much on him providing that manna from heaven as he did finding water sources for them, even if he had to produce them out of rock. Since one thing, if you bring a man in the desert a cup of water, that's great. But if you give a man a river of water in the desert, now that's life changing. Jesus stands up on that day of abundance symbolized. And he says, out of your heart will flow uh, streams of living water. That is a river, if you will, that never runs dry. Christ promises not just a little bit, but He promises an everlasting life, a life-changing event. And all you have to do to get this life-changing event in your life
life as you walk through a desert land trying for this source and that choice to bring some kind of appeasement, some kind of pleasure to you, some, some way of alleviating your spiritual hurt and your physical pain and all of that kind of stuff. As you go through life, you find out as, as you go through, nothing satisfies. Nothing satisfies. It's kind of like being on a hot day and uh, uh, somebody gives you the option of uh, uh, a glass of lemonade or uh, a glass of water. I always pick the water because when I drink the lemonade, I'm going to thirst again. But if I don't get enough water, I'll stop being thirsty. So people try this elixir and they try this thing. Marriages and sex and drugs and, and money and whatever, vacations and recreations, and sometimes they just try to forget that all this trouble is for them. They try and they keep on being thirsty in a dry land. But for those who thirst and take in Christ, they take in Him, they believe in Him, they submit to Him, and they begin to understand His teaching, and they call Him Lord and Savior. For Him, He places in them a source of everlasting life. An abundance. Now, this is great. Dr. Ron Lynch used to say it like this. He said, there are always people out there looking for something beyond the stars. They're looking for someone to invade this earth. They're, they're looking for something from the outside to come in and rescue them. That's what Jesus has promised. He's promised to come from the outside of this earth and place himself in the inside of us so that he's taken over our lives and he's given us life-changing events so that the things that we do in our life are no longer us doing it, but Christ doing it. It's no longer me who is able to minister. It's Christ who's ministering to me. It's no longer you who are just praying and hoping. Now it's you with the Spirit of God inside of you directing your prayers and, and, and cleaning them up and putting them in a presentable fashion for the Father to act on them, right? So, He promises to put them inside of you and then He says, out of His heart, uh, I think the King James says, out of His belly, in the innermost depth of His soul, out will flow rivers of living, living water. So, if He puts it into you, He intends to get it out of you. See, we're not the light. But we're reflections of the light. That's what Jesus says to his brothers up here. He says, my time has not come, verse 6, uh, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but the world hates me, because I testify that it's works of evil. When Jesus comes down and shines his light, men are upset about that because their works are evil. They, the light shines, we're evil, we've got to get away from it. Jesus says to his unbelieving half-brothers, he says, the world's always going to accept you right at this moment in time in your life. Now, we know that James, his half-brother James, writes the book of James. We know that uh, his half-brother Jude writes the book of Jude. We believe these are right. We believe that they come to him. Matter of fact, one of the people that, that he appears to over the first Corinthians chapter 15 is his half-brother James. So after Christ arrived, they said, you know, well, he was him. So they fall in and they want to be have him as Lord and Master, but at this time they're not with the program because they have not submitted to him. They're trying to prove that he's a fraud, right? They want to get this all taken care of. And Jesus says that the light that I shine makes people hate me. So if we're not the light and we reflect the light, then we should be ready for somebody somewhere not to like us too much. That's what happens when we come in with the Bible. That's what happens when we try to correct people, right? Even folks who come to church, right? Even people who are, are not doing right. As we mature in Christ, we, we want to study His Word more. We want to assemble more with His people. That's part of that. We want to, to put our money in the offering plate. We want to feel our knees praying and being concerned about other folks. That's what's called maturity in Christ. And and the very lack of those things sometimes you can kind of look at it and say, well, you know, maybe they're not as mature in Christ as they ought to. And if you see people being stingy with their resources and their time, and especially their love for other men, 
that it could say something about them because Christ said that what he would put in you would flow out as rivers of living water. So if you're stingy with the water, right, it could be that you don't really know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. One said the greatest crime in the desert is to know where water is and not tell someone. And notice he doesn't say just river. I, again, I think the Bible is very specific. I think it says rivers. So that's rivers of joy. That's rivers of love. That's rivers of care and compassion. Plenty of things for us to minister to and be ministers of. Why is that, Brother Tony? Because we believe in Him when we receive the Holy Spirit. And that gift changes us from the inside out. So then, if we're not changed, then we don't possess the Spirit of God. But get this, if you have the Spirit of God, you don't have to ever ask for a second feeling of God. There are plenty of, of people who teach that we need a, a second blessing from heaven. When you've got the Spirit of God inside of you, you've got all the blessing that heaven's going to give you. It's not just about being able to speak in tongues or, or, or some other uh, show something. What it's about is being changed and submitted. And what it's about is understanding that we have the ability inside of us to overcome that's what's on the outside. That's why it says, greater is he who is in you than he in the world. There's a reason for that. You have the Spirit of God inside of you. And Jesus is trying to tell these people that it has never been about the natural. You keep looking at Jesus as a historical figure, you're going to miss the fact that he is, he is not just a historical figure, but he is the author and finisher of our faith. Christ is not just natural, he is supernatural. And the gift he offers you through the blood that he shed and through the spirit he gives is the ability to access that same supernatural life and live in abundance. I'm not talking about he's going to put money in your checking account or all that other stuff that prosperity gospel say. But I'm saying that God gives you the resources the resources to continue to depend on Him and continue to see Him make one day come. Remember when Christ prays His, his model prayer, He asked the Father to give Him His daily bread. Right. Lord, don't give me a month's worth of bread. I just need to get by today. Why? Because you don't know when your last day is and you don't need provisions for when you're not here. What you need is to make sure that Christ Christ is working in you and around you and that you have that spirit of love, spirit of generosity, spirit of concern flowing from you because we are a supernatural people because we have drank the living water. And we have eternity on our side. And we need to act like the people who have eternity on their side can afford to be patient, if not anxious. People who have eternity on their side can get relationships right. Not here in this world, in the world to come. People who have eternity on their side uh, will have abundance, right? If you take a penny and you begin to put a penny back over every day of your life, uh, it may not be much in 70 years, but you do it over 7 million years, <laughs> or 700 million years, you see, the, you see the abundance that is there because of eternal life. Let's pray.